Hello. Hey, Jerry. I hear you, but I don't see you. Yeah. You, you see that what the screen I'm sharing? I see a, um, a, a planetary nebula. Yeah. So uh, this is oh, the astro, astro bin. Oh, you mean in the Scorpius thing? Yeah. 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 I'm sh sharing that astrobin.com. Okay. Feature image of the day. Mm hmm. Which is what uh, Dick Beam has been working on. Yeah. It's interesting. I don't know if it says Pix powered by Pix Insight. I don't know if the Pix Insight puts on this uh, information on top of the image. Must I bet it does. I think that means that it was used to, to process the image. But uh, I don't know. I, I could be corrected there. So um, that's a, a challenge now because Scorpius is getting real low in the West. Yeah, I thought I thought it was okay until August or something. Oh or, yeah, you can still see it, but I mean, it's getting. You like to take pictures, at least I do, when when it's very high up, as high as you can the, get at up. the meridian, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah. So if I go back, this this website has these pe people do such great work. Yeah, they do. A lot of time people are putting into this. Yes, it takes more time. My my experience, it takes more time to process than it does to take. Huh. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a YouTube channel called the Imaging Channel, Astro Imaging Channel. Uh -huh. and they have they have once a week they have a, a speaker on that talks about how they do their astrophotography and yeah. such. Pretty pretty smart. Yeah. I was kind of half listening to one today. Hmm. Who was the speaker? Uh, Ron Butcher or something. No, Ron Breacher. Yeah. And that's and that's not Ron. <laughs> they, this is their all their stuff they have. Uh -huh. My guru is Adam Block or Tony Hallis. Adam Block, I think that's the guy that uh, Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, he uses that image on his newsletter that I get from Adam Block. And Adam Block is like Mount Lemon type of guy in Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a number of um, pictures that are um, astronomical picture of the day. Are you still there? Yep. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. I get nervous when things go quiet. <laughs> yeah. I'm blocking the screen. I'm eating right now, so I'm not showing my face. Okay, go ahead. Manje away. Had a late, late dinner. Uh huh. Got tacos from uh, Los Agaves. Okay, I like the ones from Los Arroyos. I don't know. Is it Los Arroyos or Los Agaves across the street there, at Camino Real Marketplace? Camino Real. You mean it's across from the pet house? Across no, Cali Real. Los Arroyos? Is it? Or Los Agaves? No, Los, Los Agaves is across the street from us over here. Okay. So Los, Los Arroyos must be the one over by on Cali Real. Yeah, yeah. Los Arroyos makes really good um, Cadillac margaritas. <laughs> is your Tesla doing the driving on the way home or what? Oops, Jerry, lost you. No. Jerry, where are you? Uh, 
the image astro imaging channel. Jerry, or did I lose it? Am I lost? Who's lost? Oh, there's Chuck. Admit Chuck. Chuck, can you see the, the screen I'm sharing? Lost Jerry. Chuck, are you there? Yes. Yeah, I'm screen sharing the Astro Imaging Channel. Because I'm eating dinner, so I'm <laughs> blocking my view. Jerry was here, but then he got lost somehow. He seems to drop out a lot. In the beginning, then it, I guess he resets the computer and that probably brings him back. Oh, okay. Memory leaks somewhere and it runs out and he has to reset. Yeah, I'm not sure what he has for equipment. There's Jerry. Admit him back. Did it say uh, the this the the system was recording when you got yes. on? Yes. yes, it did. Back again. <laughs> Welcome home. Thanks. I was on for a while, and then I guess Tom didn't like it, and he pulled the plug. Yeah, that's right. Did you have to restart, or? Yeah, well, I was part way. I pulled the plug to the uh, internet, and then I plugged it back in and started up from there. I didn't op restart my whole computer. Huh. Did you have to relaunch the meeting? Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. Well, I don't know if I had to, but I did. Probably a good policy. Yeah. You never know what's left behind. Yeah, I think I've got a flaky system. It's getting old. It's full of too much dog shed or something. <laughs> Cat hair seems to work better. <laughs> it gets into the cracks, nooks and crannies better. Yeah. Hey, Bob. How you doing, Chuck? Doing well. Hello. Good. Good. I, I apologize for my crappy video. My other computer is downloading it. A uh, huge program, and I can't use it, so I'm back to my laptop with a crappy, <laughs> crappy camera. <laughs> you look really you good, though. <laughs> oh boy! Anyway, so what's the big program you're downloading? Oh, I I am a flight simulator guy, and uh, those I are first got, yeah, Microsoft Flight Simulator back in the late '80s. And I've done subsequent uh, upgrades to it. So the one that's come out, 2020, is uh, a huge program, and it's terabytes of data. But uh, it's just an incredible program. I mean, I don't, I don't know if any of you have done this, but it is so realistic. You can fly in different parts of the world, and you actually see the structures and the topography because it's based on Google World. They've integrated yeah. Google World into the all the landscaping. And uh, then you can fly in real time weather any place in the world. Uh, and you can create your own weather if you don't like what you're in. <laughs> so you're the one that's been messing with the weather lately, huh? Yeah. That's it. That's it. So anyway, I'm downloading. They periodically update it. So uh, I've got... Uh, uh, 24.9 gigabytes of 40.29 gigabytes. <laughs> wow. I, I, I used to fly it in the 90s, and I remember there was a Learjet you could fly, and it performed particularly well. So I used to try to fly inverted under the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I used to do that. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, but I mean, the, the detail of the aircraft and the cockpits and all are just stunning. I mean, they're all very realistic. It's, well, you know a little bit what it's like, Chuck, but I mean, just, just imagine that magnified many times Yeah. with much more detail. There's a and, place up there near Fremont, I think it was, that had uh, F-18 simulators, you know, just huh. not, not a real sim F-18 simulator, but that's what they were supposed to be. 
and they were yeah. fairly good on the inside and had fairly good graphics. But what was neat was they had two sets of like six and you could fly on teams against six other oh. people, you know, yeah. six versus yeah. six. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, well, the technology involved in, in this is just in how they, how they pull all of this together mm -hmm. in a coherent way and, uh, and, 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 and respond in real time. In real time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because, uh, it, yeah, it's just, it's uh, pretty stunning. I was showing my brother it when he was here. He was here recently from come down from Solvang, and he was just amazed at, at what it looked like. <laughs> but you got to have a gaming computer. You have to have a high speed, and you got to have terabytes of storage. I mean, you have to. It's uh, really heavy duty on the storage. Resource hog. Re big time. <laughs> uh, Anyway, that's what my com other computer's doing. <laughs> I thought it'd be done by now. <laughs> but anyway, well, you can see me uh, reasonably well, I guess, and hear my voice. Yeah, so, yeah it's yeah. working fine. <laughs> OK. So, oh, that's from, is that Tom's? No, oh, it's Tom's. Cat's Eye that? Nebula. Cat's Eye, yeah. 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 Um, I'm blocking my, blocking my video because I'm eating dinner. That's okay. Tom's avatar for the meeting for the evening. Uh, I, I'll just while we're waiting for our guys, I'll quickly update you on the observatory here. That yeah, I cannot believe how enthusiastic the folks are here about this. It it just uh, has blown away all my expectations. Uh, so, you know, we have raised all the money plus a couple grand for maintenance. And uh, then uh, I have six people now who have volunteered to help me operate the observatory. So they're gonna be the assistants and uh, we'll be meeting shortly. And the, we're still, I think, gonna have the building and dome here in October. So uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's been it's been pretty amazing. They've asked me to put some of my photos up in one of the uh, display areas here. Uh, and so it's uh, the response to this has been really, really uh, interesting, gratifying. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> so we're, we're moving on with it. <laughs> Okay, well, let me show you something, unless you got more, Bob. No, no, I, I, am, I am starving to do some observing, yeah. observing and astrophotography. I haven't done any for months now, and I'm getting a little bit weird. <laughs> and now it's monsoon season. <laughs> now it's monsoon season, right? <laughs> no, go ahead, Jerry. I mean, I'm, I'm finished. That's all. Can you, see, can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is, we talked about it briefly and I, I fumbled the explanation, but plane wave instruments last time makes a um, direct drive mount. And this is the larger version of their mount shown there. It's a one arm fork. And they have a smaller version that sells for $10,000, um, 11,000 in California. And at the advanced imaging conference in 2018, the last door prize given away from the drawing was the $11,000 direct drive mount from plane wave. Wow. And it was given to a guy who was talked into coming to the conference by his two astronomy buddies because he wasn't sure he wanted to get into astronomy. So he came to it and he walked <laughs> away with this dream mount. And so I'm not sure his friends were his friends anymore. But the key <laughs> thing about this mount is that it's direct drive, there's no gears. And so this is, this is what it looks like. The base of it is this is actually the motor and that's all there is, just one part turns and these are magnets and then there's um, coils that uh, in the part that sits down on it. So mm -hmm. it, it actually uh, has no gearing in it at all. It's just direct drive. 
So it's, it's quite a breakthrough. If they claim that with the, any of these direct drive things, you can um, get between a quarter of a second of an arc and half a second of an arc of uh, tracking accuracy. Mm. So that's, that's extremely good. Less than you're seeing in most places. Yeah, I think my, my pictures usually end up being about three seconds of an arc at best for the stars that I, I take pictures of. So it's really cool. And there, there shows the base of it. And what you're looking at in the top picture is this part and then the coil part sits on top of it. Mm. So they uh, have been quite an innovator and in stuff like this. Um, it's a bunch of, all, of former Celestron employees. I, a couple of them are, but they were at, um, they were at a school um, down in Claremont region or somewhere down there, a state college. And they tried to, they happened upon a design for a corrected Dalkirkham and they were doing optical design. And as their project, they made a telescope of, to the design because the design showed absolutely incredible um, resolution. It's a corrected Dalkirkham. So it operates essentially a diffraction limited over a wide field of the wide portion of the field of view. And it's much easier to make than um, uh, an RC scope because the RC has a parabola and a hyperbola. This one has an undercorrected um, parabola on the, on the bottom of the tube and it has a spherical secondary on the top. It's extremely easy to make, extremely easy to align. And it costs about one third of the um, cost okay. of an RC. And I think that the when they introduced these things, people took to them like ducks to water. And I think that probably was the major contributor to uh, RC optics going out of business. So, and now these, these are the, the fair haired child of NASA and stuff. They're supplying giant telescopes and they developed this for very active tracking. If you need, if you get one of these you, and you operate it as they show it here as an alt as, then when you image, you have to have a field rotator. To, uh, because the, it doesn't track as an equatorial mount does. Right. And their list down here, they have a typical setup is the CDK um, and the, on an L600 mount, which you saw up there, the field rotator, which is uh, $4,500, and then a focuser accessory control. So it comes to about $80,000 to set up the scope you wow. want here. Wow. And that's a CDK, it's a 24 inch diameter scope. So mm. it's not something I'm gonna run out and buy, but it's so an that's, that's the size of the Westmont scope and <laughs> costs a lot less. That's what? That's the size of the Westmont scope. Oh yeah. yeah. But it costs a lot less. Yeah. And it's much sexier looking. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's, those uh, wealthy amateurs or institutions? Yeah. Oh yeah, that that reminds me of uh, if you hadn't heard my joke, uh, it was uh, what if uh, what if UFOs are really just alien billionaires? <laughs> hey, there he is. Uh, hi, Tom. Oh, there's some tomato sauce on your. Sh oh no, just kidding. <laughs> I did have marinara sauce for dinner. For <laughs> Yeah, Tom set himself up for a spillage there. Who, um, who was talking about the area around Antares? Um, Dick you, Beam. Dick, Dick, yeah. Uh, I was thinking if he showed up tonight. Uh, on page 77 of the August edition of Stein Telescope, there is an image of the very same area that he took. Mm -hmm. and And it... I mean, it, it, I thought he'd be very encouraged because I think his work is just as good. And this is one that, you know, is published in Sky and Telescope and at the back of the magazine. And uh, so I just wanted to alert him to it that if he wanted to take a look at that, he might. I'll show a picture it. of that just before you guys got on and before I crashed off. Can you show yeah, that? Yeah, let me come Sure, I'll, it's right here. Let's see, uh, image of the day on astrobin.com. And I got a 
click on share screen. Yeah, it's mm. yeah, Dick did a pretty good job. And this is no, it was done by Don Laurie, maybe. Yeah, it's yeah, a little different, different image than I had earlier. But it's got it's, I don't know what puts on the uh, coordinates on top of the image. Oh, it's, it's when you put the cursor on the picture. Yeah, but I'm just curious uh, is it's that a, uh, done it's by Astro Bin? Pix Insight, it says. Yeah, it says powered by Pix Insight. Mm. So maybe Pix Insight can do that for somebody's picture. Yeah, and not, I can not see where that would get really irritating. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's Let me actually, show this part right here. Yeah. That's a better photo than what's in Sky and Telescope. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see. What does it say? Integration 13 hours and 40 minutes. Does that makes sense. 82 yep. frames by 600 seconds. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, yeah. And it's it's doing those coordinates are coming from astrometry.net. That's what I use for uh, for the asteroid occultations to verify my field. See you, Tom. And later, Jasper. Thanks. Thanks for dinner. Yeah. It's about five arc seconds per pixel. Oh, it's right there. Mm -hmm. Huh. What's what's typical scale for something like that? There's no typical scale. It's whatever camera and telescope combination you have. If you have, there... if you have a fast system, you want um, small pixels. Oh, look! Part of what's getting a good picture is guess where she is, Australia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dark skies. Uh, and overhead. <laughs> yeah. No. And overhead, right. <laughs> where, where did you see it said Australia on there? Uh, in that description. I think it was. Oh. Well, the Heavens Mirror <coughs> Observatory. Amateur hosting facility. Uh, maybe, maybe the description scrolls, because I thought, oh, here it is, from Dark Skies in Australia. Yeah, it's the last sentence of the first paragraph under description. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So people are commenting on it. Yeah. Pretty sweet. Yeah, let's send in a comment, say, I've seen better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you got when you got dark skies and overhead. Yeah, yeah just say Australia is cheating. Come up here and try that. <laughs> Yeah, Australia so, has its problems too. Fires and dust storms and spiders. Angry Kings. Sounds like Arizona. <laughs> yeah, sounds like Arizona. So has Arizona had a lot of monsoonal rain coming down or what? Oh boy. Well, we have, no kidding. And flooding. I mean, we haven't been affected here where we're living uh, with, with the flooding. We've lost some, some uh, shrubbery and trees or branches off trees. But parts around us here got really, really flooded and cars washed away. I mean, it's been pretty dramatic. But last year we had nothing. It was totally dry. This year it's making up for it, I guess. Well, we really need the rain. I mean, we don't like the flooding, of course, <laughs> but uh, the rain is very welcome because it's so dry. Yeah, we Bruce, can, can you hear us. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it took me visible. 20 minutes to even get to here. Can you see okay, the, you the screen I'm sharing, sharing right now? Good. Oh, there you are. Good. So Astro Ooh, what, they take, what they take the sun picture on, do they say what they used? Let's see what it says. It's big. Let's see. It looks like a composite. Well, what kind of filter did they use here? Daystar Quark oh, Chromosphere. Yeah, all right. It's an 80 ED. <clears throat> it says apochromatic oh, refractor, uh, but it's actually a doublet. That gives it nice color fringes. Yeah, I've got one of those, and it really does have very little color. It's, it's a beautiful doublet. And it's cheap, too. It was only like $500.
Yeah. So the, the, this is a uh, Bob. Is this? Do you have a Daystar cork? Is that what you have? Uh, yeah, I I have a Daystar. I and I've used it on uh, that very inexpensive Orion. Not it doesn't have a. It's not a ED. But uh, I've been able to get some pictures uh, of prominences and uh, not lately. That's something I want to do. Once we get the observatory going here, I wanted to get into some more uh, solar photography. But, what, do you, what, filter, what filter do you use to get the prominences? Quark. It's, yeah, it's, it's built into the um, quark and it's, it's um, then okay, I use some is... other, when I use, an additional, uh, I forget now, it's, um, it's been so long since I've used it, mm -hmm. but I use some that cuts the ultraviolet and infrared as there's a cut filter. So I use that. Yeah, here's the one. Yeah, that's, that's what I have. Uh, I have the one that uh, is designed, it's the prominence model is the one that I have. I would be really nervous as some, uh, with something that goes at the, you know, at the focal plane. Yeah, me too, unless that's an electronic thing and you read, you look at a screen to see the image. You do to see the image, I think, but yeah. But it burns a hole in the filter. Well, you oh. use a filter with it and I don't know if it says what to use here. Anyway, um, I have a couple of filters that go with it. Uh, and so it never, it doesn't heat up. It doesn't get hot. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's I tried fine. To, I tried to take a bunch of pictures of the sun over a period of time. And the most notice, I got good pictures, but I also noticed that I got over, me, I got overheated. You're out there in the middle of the day with the sun shining on you. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Trying to get out of that. You can't. <laughs> and so I put a black cloth over it and that, that just got way too hot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Well, you know, in the summer is not the time you want to do solar work here. <laughs> I'd rather do it at night, but then uh, yeah. that's the problem, Jerry. <laughs> that's why you have a remote observatory. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah. But anyway, I've been very pleased with that. I, and I've been able to uh, visually observe, you know, actually you watch over a period of, you know, a number of minutes and go back, you can actually see changes in the prominence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's really, uh, it's pretty awesome. And people who've seen it and looked through it, it has been awestruck by seeing the prominences. Uh, what, what happens to a regular telescope like the ED80 and you're, you're pointing it at the sun? Is that hard on a telescope and the filters at the, you know, not protecting the telescope? If you, if you put the filter at the eyepiece end, then it's going to heat up your, I mean, the glass is clear. It doesn't absorb much, about 1% of the light, but that's still a lot of heat. And depending on the glass, some glasses can't take it and they will crack. So, so you don't put a filter on the front of the scope? Yeah. Well, I, I never, I always put a filter on the front. I put on a Daystar thing that looks like it's solid aluminum. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, well, that, well, when I put on, when I put that on, Jerry, if I remember right, it's been so long since I've used my solar scope uh, uh -huh. that it 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 darkened the image so much that I couldn't see, I could hardly see anything in the day star and the, um, you really? know, the I haven't, I haven't had that problem. I see the it it makes it orangeish looking. But still very bright to see. Well, that's like... a Thousand Oaks filter, then, right? Well, oh, but yeah. you know, we also had we had this conversation last time. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, Jerry was saying he wasn't going to put a a, a a film filter on 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 in front of his nine thousand dollar scope. Yeah. Well, I've got the film filter. It's made by Botter, uh -huh. and the basic material isn't clear. It's black plastic, and then the front of it's got a, a aluminized coating. Uh -huh. So even if you get a scratch in the front, you don't, you, you might get some halos and, you know, and some artifacts, but you don't get a blast of the sun. It's easy to poke a hole in those though. Yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, about. they're very uh, fragile. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm confusing Thousand Oaks with Daystar. I, I use a Thousand Oaks filter. No, that's been out of glass. Y yes, I use optical glass ones. 
Right. So I've used the mylar. I've used that that silver, and they're very they're fragile. But uh, you know, um, I when I start using it again, I'll you know, it's the it, I actually what I've done I followed the directions that come with it in terms of the filter that you're supposed to use, and it doesn't call for a filter over the front of the telescope. No, I, yeah, I, I and know. so. When I use those filters with it, it just looks, uh, it looks, I mean, it looks great. It looks yeah. just, so um, that's all I, I mean, that's all I remember right now, Jerry. I, I okay. can't remember the specific, I've got them all here, but but they're, they're stored away. <laughs> but we want to see the prominences, so we want to, we don't want to just see the sunspots, we want to see all the, what do you call it, the, the what are the different prominences on the front of the sun called? Flares, faculae. There's Coronal mass ejections. Way. Yeah, that would be a big right. one now. Flares, yeah. yeah. Filaments, yeah. filaments, filaments. Filaments, Terrible. Yeah. Forgetting all these terms. So Memory is a, memory is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> I didn't remember that. <laughs> okay, well, there are a lot of memory jokes that go around this place, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you walk up every now and then to somebody, and I walked up to this one guy and he announced to me, he says, Well, I don't remember much. You know, he says, He talked to me and I don't going to remember much. I said, That's fine. That's fine. You know, bless you. You know, and. <laughs> What do you do? <laughs> uh, you know, Bob, Bob, last time Dick Beam was talking about his Explorer dorm that he'd ordered from OPT had fallen through. And uh, he, uh, now he's trying to figure out which way to go. I think Jerry's got the right idea. Just make a shed and have it roll, roll top, right, Jerry? Yeah, roll, yeah. roll off roof. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you've got the room, that's the way to go. But yeah, I don't I like, have the room. I like looking at the whole sky at once. Yeah, there are advantages to that. I mean, we could have gone that way. Uh, Gotta go. Sorry. Bye. Bye. Leaving us? Yeah, hey, you going yeah. out to space? <laughs> there you go. Chuck's probably gonna yeah. go do an occultation. Yeah. Oh, he's got an occultation. Okay. <laughs> Possibly. I don't know. Not now. It's still too light for an occultation. It takes time Maybe to set up. Gotta get like somewhere. That. Oh. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> So, um, well, I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, I don't. Did, did, did the company? Uh, did they go out of business, or did he say what what the problem was? Uh, yeah, it looks like they just didn't respond. Think, or well, like they did. Like they, they went out of business. Had a, they probably had a supply problem, like most small businesses are. Yeah, and they just couldn't deliver. And he just got tired of the runaround, so he called OPT and it canceled the order. Okay. Well, I I looked into that uh, observatory when we were considering what to do here, uh -huh. and I I wrote a couple times and I didn't get a response. And that to me, that's a negative. Yeah. If you probably. if you write a company and they don't get back to you. You know, either they're not competent, they're not interested, and I was something. But anyway, I for, I just quit. I didn't go any further with it. I, this this it's is called their right. history. Yeah, something's not their, right here. You know, their history. Yeah, yeah. So the folks I've been working with at uh, at Home Dome, uh, every time I write there, the owner writes back to me and you know lets me know what's going on. So they've been very good so far. And uh, so I'm hoping that they will, they delayed it because of supply problems, but I'm hoping that we're still on for uh, October. I'll have to go, I'll have to check back. Now, did October. you look into doing a roll top uh, roof thing for uh, an observatory? Uh, no. Because you probably don't have the room for that, right? And right, that would be a, a drawback. And um, 
in terms of what's commercially available, a lot of the roll tops, you know, are 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 built by amateurs themselves. And yeah, it's home built. You, you start cutting the wood and put it together yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I don't have the the time and energy to do that kind of thing, Bruce. And uh, the people that work here, you know, they're they're employees and they have a lot of tasks. I mean, this is uh, this place is like. Um, it's like running a big cruise ship. I mean, it's just a, I mean, or a big a motel or hotel. It's, it's a, there's a lot going on here, uh, much more than I realized before we moved in. So these people are very busy. And then, and, you know, and then uh, COVID on top of everything else, trying to keep everybody safe. So, um, so they, uh, it, I, I just couldn't, that doesn't seem the way to go. And, um, so the home dome looked like a really good solution. And so I think it, I think it will be. This company has been around for a long time. And I think they started in 1992. And they have uh, units all over the world. And they have a lot of customers have written in and written about their product. And- uh, Positive, I assume. Them. What? Positive reviews, I assume. Uh, mostly, yeah. There have been, you know, a few issues here and there, but yeah, mostly. And uh, they continue to advertise, so, you know, their their ads haven't disappeared from Sky and Telescope. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so anyway, uh, so far I've been, I've been pleased with how they've operated and they're very businesslike. So we'll see. So I ordered a screen, a stainless steel screen for one of my patio heaters because it had disintegrated. That happens with stainless when it's hot over a long period of time. And it was, it was a reasonable price and I signed up for it. And that was six months ago. Yeah. They can't deliver, you know, the same yeah. thing. I don't know where it's made, but uh, it's not happening. Yeah. They probably had to get a day job. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, this is something I bought from Home Depot. So I had the, the, the oh. book on it and everything and the SKU number. And I logged on and said, yeah, I want one of these. And, but not happening. Yeah. My first wife keeps reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob, uh, Bruce, is the screen really necessary? Yeah, the uh, gas flame uh, heats the screen and it turns uh, red hot. And that radiates the... Uh, infrared heat out to you you know the the uh the flame itself is like 5000 degrees and it doesn't it doesn't have any it doesn't radiate infrared very well mm -hmm. plus my the top of that heater is only about four inches tall now because mm. that whole thing is just collapsed it's disintegrated We have an infrared heater over here that never use it. Just used it once for a party over here. And just kind of sits around. Are you running it off of a, a portable um, a propane? Uh, yeah, it's got a propane tank in its base. I hate that the propane tanks they have they have dates when they expire that they're no good anymore. <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to use it until it runs out of propane. I mean, I have two of them. The other one is older, but it's in good shape. It hasn't disintegrated. Different stainless. Probably a three or four versus two or three or whatever. There was a thing uh, I read about uh, stainless, by the way, that uh, it's a um, it's now implicated in causing type two diabetes. Because the chromium, the chromium in the stainless is what causes it not to, to uh, corrode and it forms a layer of chromium oxide on the surface it's about seven percent chromium but if you store food or cook food in stainless steel containers that's acidic it leaches out some of that chromium so you get it in your system and they're now finding that i mean the, the rates of type 2 by diabetes has skyrocketed especially in poorer countries where they use a lot of stainless steel pots so that's being a uh, big no-no i guess i think really our cookware stainless that. steel our pots that we have if 
copper is embedded somewhere, but it looks like a stainless surface for sure. Well, the so, copper is on the bottom to spread the heat. That's Revere. But mm -hmm. the interior of the pot is stainless. Yeah. Mm, what's, what's the alternative? Cast iron? Glass. Glass. Uh, <laughs> what, what do you, cast I don't iron. Know. No, cast iron is fine because uh, iron, you need iron, hemoglobin. <laughs> uh, but uh, you properly season a, a cast iron pot, it'll last forever. No, so that's true. If you season it, yeah. yeah. What's that? Have you have you dealt with those ceramic coated ones? Those seem kind of nice. They're slip. They're like they're they're non non stick. And my wife's got her favorite pan that I'm forbidden to use. It's one of those. It's the ceramic coated and nothing sticks to it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they the Tef, There was a Teflon controversy a while back. Uh, but see, the Teflon problem. also leaches into what you're cooking. Yeah, but but. I think some of the newer pots don't use Teflon. Isn't, isn't it a new formulation? It's something else than Teflon. Ceramic, I think. Yeah, some kind of ceramic surface, I think. Not sure. Yeah. yeah. I can ask Jackie. But Jackie knows about everything there need, is to know about cooking. My wife is just, <laughs> she knows so much about cooking. <laughs> yeah. so Keeps Bob, you well fed. Bob, are you guys uh, on your own for dinners and l breakfast, lunch, and dinners, or do you guys do group uh, things there for food? Oh, you can. You've got a lot of variety, a lot of choices. I mean, you can you can eat here, or you can go down. We have three different restaurants. Uh, there's uh, uh, a cafe, which is very uh, just uh, very informal. Then there's a kind of mid-range restaurant. You you have to put pants on in the evening. I mean, <laughs> that sounds funny. And that may not have pants on. Right. So you have to put long, long, long pants on, right? <laughs> long pants on, right. <laughs> that was a little weird. And so, um, you know, we got, um, but during during the day, during lunch, you can wear news. And then there's a, there's a, a really fancy restaurant, uh, fine dining thing where you got our coat and tie and, and we're going to go with a couple there uh, this this Friday which uh, I'm not a coat and tie guy particularly but I will especially when it's hot but uh, we'll go do it so you can do that or you can eat in your place I mean so you got all you got a lot of choices you can have stuff delivered to your room you don't want to cook and you don't want to go out you just order it up so so, you know, it's not hard living here. <laughs> well, I got I to gotta ask you, during, during this pandemic, did you guys do Instacart delivery of groceries to yourself or? Yes, uh, we did. We both ordered through the uh, through Westminster. See, they have, they, they get all this wholesale food and stuff, vegetables and fruit and so on. So you could order stuff through Westminster or you could actually call stores up and have the stores deliver, many of the grocery stores have their own delivery service or use Instacart or whatever. So we were doing both. And um, the thing that's nice, uh, as, as far as Jackie and I are concerned, Jackie's uh, very, very busy outside of here. And she has a lot of stuff going on outside of, of Westminster. So when she's gone, um, you know, I can either choose to eat here, have lunch here, or go downstairs and have lunch or whatever. So there's a lot of flexibility, you know, which, which you can do. Very good. So, yeah. So, you know, uh, there are downsides to it too, but, but uh, where I'm getting in my age, it's, it's a good thing. I mean, I think it's a good place, good kind of situation to be in right now. Reaching any age is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Like better than the alternative. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, did you do anything else with your uh, old photos? Or are you doing any other uh, work with that? No, I just found them in a closet and I was sort of looking at them, but that's about it. I've got better that... pictures of the same things I've taken much more recently. 
<laughs> it's just yes. nostalgic. Yeah. Bob, Bob, if you go back last week's show, Jerry showed uh, some, what were they, 1960 photos or what? Yeah, my photos I took when I was in high school. Oh, gee, yeah. I wish I'd, no, it's too bad. We try oh, X well, film. I would have yeah. liked to have seen that. that well, I got Bob, some old ones like that too. But Bob, the, the yeah. show is on YouTube. You know, if you go oh, to our, okay. our yeah. YouTube channel, just look for okay. the July 20 show. Yeah, and, uh, okay, I'll go take a look. That'd be fun to see because uh, I've got old ones. But Jerry, don't, don't, aren't you impressed with how much progress you've made? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I related this last week. Film uh, uh, ex uh, intercepts about 7% of the photons that go into it and, and, you know, and, and turns the silver into silver, silver halide into silver. Whereas modern uh, CCD and uh, whatnot cameras process over 70% of the photons that come into them. So it's a 10 times increase or more of the yeah. sensitivity yeah. of the modern sensors. But the main thing that makes photography or imaging so much uh, superior now is that the cameras we use, the semiconductor detectors are linear and the film oh. had reciprocity <laughs> failure. Yeah. So it doesn't build up linearly so you can you can reach things that uh, um, professional scopes were only able to you reach 21st magnitude. You can get there with a backyard telescope of about 20 inches uh, in, yeah. in just a relatively short time. Yeah. Well, the other to me the other huge thing with digital cameras is that in the days of film, you really had to have your own dark room to process your stuff. And unless you knew somebody, my son was in, my younger son was into photography and he built a dark room in our garage. But I mean, that was really uh, technically demanding. And, uh, you know, that really kept me back from doing much astrophotography. You know, because I never, I never had a real dark room. I, I would close off, I had an interior bathroom and I'd put black paper over the one little window. Ah. And then I'd close the door and stuff towels around it for light. And I'd, I'd put um, the, um, the, what is it, projector? No, the larger on a pad on, over the sink. You know, so I put a piece of plywood there. And then I had a, a, a tray of chemicals on the back of the toilet, uh -huh. on the seat of the toilet, <laughs> and on the floor. And I hoped that the cat hadn't got in there with me, although it had a couple times. So I had to turn on the light to get all the chemicals off its paws before it tried to lick them all off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. And then in the, for the film, yeah. I would load film into the canisters or the cut film holders. I'd just go in the closet and push all the clothing aside and stuff, you know, towels around the cracks in the door or put tape. And then I'd load everything in the dark by feel. And there, you can also use these uh, Ziploc or these, they have these bags that your hands go in, a dark bag, and yeah, you can feel yeah. everything in there. So you can load all the stuff up you want, even up to where you put the negatives in a, one of these tanks to process it. So yeah, I, I did all of that in high school with four by five sheet film. Yeah, I did too. That's what I'm, <laughs> I did 127 film, uh, 35 millimeter and uh, four by five. Yeah. I remember bringing a roll of uh, 35 millimeter, 36 shots in to be developed and um, didn't say particularly that they were astro photos. So basically they told me, no, it was all blank. <laughs> and, and, and so I said, no, yeah. no, it's astro photos. And so they redid it, but they didn't know where to cut the negatives. And so they cut every shot in half rather than getting oh, it wonderful. on the right. Yeah, boy. So I, I learned to take a white shot you know, before, yeah. so they could see where the boundaries Get were. Get them in phase. Yeah. Tom, how come my uh, video doesn't show up? I don't know. Is your video turned off? No, not that I'm aware of. I thought I pushed the share video, I, but I, I don't I, see how to do that now. I'm going to click on something that says, ask to start video. So I'm asking you to start video. Start my that? video. There we go. There, there we are. go. Wonderful. There, you go. there he is. <laughs> I, I ran out because uh, next door neighbor came and rang the doorbell and wanted advice on buying a beginner telescope. <laughs> <laughs>
You that, couldn't that resist counts, that, that, Chuck. Yep. <laughs> that counts as an outreach, to, I think. You sent him <laughs> off to buy a Tasco? No, I said uh, short to baby. <laughs> Those old Tascos well, weren't bad scopes Tom, a long time ago. Tom has three eight-inch uh, for for sale on the our, our you know SPAU. Yeah. Our, no, this, this was just beginning. You know, look at the moon. So S ST eighty, <laughs> Ryan ST eighty. <laughs> uh, well, when coming back to the, the the film versus digital, the thing that totally turned the corner for me was back in 2000, right around 2000, uh, Jackie bought me this Olympus digital camera, which was the state of the art at the time. And um, so, and this, at the same time, I got my Celestron 11, the, the scope that, this is back in 2000, Bruce, that's the scope you have now. Wow, and, it's a wonderful and, scope. I know it is, it's a great scope. And uh, so, so anyway, I started pairing up the camera with the scope. And lo and behold, you know, I started getting some amazing stuff with that. And I said, boy, does this ever beat dark rooms? You know, <laughs> you get this on the computer and away we go. And so yep. that that just that just totally that's where my whole astrophotography experience really really started. You know, and today back. people go nuts with the cell phones, just hooking a cell phone up to the eyepiece. Oh, yeah. well, they do that on your yeah. scope at scar parties and they get yeah. wonderful images of the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the focal planes in the some in those in some phones are absolutely wonderful instruments. Yeah. You know, they're up in 20 megapixels. 40. 40, yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't come across the 40, but I'll take your word for it. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh. Number three. Number three. Oh, oh I bless you. <laughs> Blow out the eardrums. I was horrible, able to hit mute for that one. <laughs> oh, Anything so, else anyone wants to bring up here before we disappear for the evening? No. I, I sent uh, this Dr. Friedman one week, probably a month ago, to talk to you guys about astrophotography. Did he ever show up? The guy from Montecito? I don't oh, think so. Here on this Where would form? he have shown up? Uh, at the Zoom meeting. Yeah. To, uh, I gave him the link and, oh. and I, I said, you know, I'll email Tom. And I think I emailed you with his name, you know, so he'll let you in. And he wanted to ask about what scope to get because he wants to do astrophotography, but he also wants to do visual. He oh, yeah. Yeah. He over. showed up. He, he, yeah. he showed okay. up. Yeah. So oh, he made yeah. a lot of comments. Must have been one of the times I missed. We, we tried to confuse him. Yeah. yeah. He had kind of conflicting. We were successful. <laughs> we do our best. Yeah. <laughs> In confusing him. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't heard from him, so apparently he's happy. <laughs> the problem i find with uh, astrophotography is i get set up we go up up on like uh west camino cielo where the, the viewing is very good the seeing is good and i get involved in looking at things <laughs> and showing the night sky to other people and i don't i mean then all of a sudden you say oh wait a minute you can't see anymore i gotta put a camera on here and blah 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 and you know I, I want to get people enthused to seeing the night sky, not just me seeing the yeah. night sky. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a similar incident at CalSTAR. I took my 12 and a half inch scope and set it up on its mount, equatorial mount, got yeah. it all tuned in and I focused it. And the sea, I was looking through the eyepiece up on a stool and it was just wonderful. You know, the sky, there was no seeing problem at all. The stars were just rock steady. And I never took a picture that whole three day, three night stay. I just was looking around at everything. Yeah. And yeah. in late fall like that, I was looking at NGC 7331. And then I moved over to the region of the Stephens Quintet and I could see them. It was a very yeah. dark sky. Wow. Yeah, it's dark. What, it's what, like is, what is what is NGC 7331, you said? Yeah. What is that? It's a galaxy. 
It's mm -hmm. uh, right next to the great square of Pegasus, as I recall. I mean, be near the quintet, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I still remember, <laughs> this is uh, more than five years ago now, probably seven years ago when we were at uh, Hollister Ranch. And uh, it was the end of the evening. They had turned off all the lights. It was dark and uh, Chuck and Pat were there. I looked up and I could see all of Andromeda. Yeah. Naked eye. It was just unreal. Dramatic. Yeah. 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 But when that, you get uh, under a really dark night sky, it's so uh, overwhelming. You're just sort of awestruck, you what? know, and you're just... Look. One time I was out at a very dark site and I was setting up and then I looked up and I saw a white cloud coming up and going to block the view. And I, I sort of got mad at it and then I looked and it was actually the Milky Way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Back in uh, 85 or whenever I got my C8, I went, I went up to West Camino Cielo. Might have been 83. And it was still really dark up there then. And I had trouble aligning it because I couldn't find, you know, Polaris, basically. I mean, I, there, were, there were so many stars, I couldn't orient myself. <laughs> yeah. It makes two of us. Yeah. I've gone out into the desert where there are just so many stars. I can't figure out which one is one I'm supposed to align on. Yeah. I had an a interesting experience in talking about people around you and trying to photograph. Uh, quite a few years ago now, I went with a friend out into, uh, oh, what's the name of the, I can't think of the name of the desert area where we went. But anyway, I had the, the C-11. I took that and set up there and, and it was beautiful, but people kept coming up, you know, and wanting to see, and they wanted to see Saturn. Saturn was there, and <laughs> so they wanted to see Saturn. Anyway, I got, finally got set up and I wanted to do some photography of the Sabaro uh, galaxy because I couldn't see that from our place in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I took photos and all, and I got back home and the focus was crappy. I mean, it, oh. I, I lost my concentration with people yeah. around. And, you know, when you focus, man, you've just got to be really concentrated. Make those sharp, stars sharp. Well, now you got those button off masks that really make it easy. Well, now, nah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, right. That's the concept. do. It makes it easy now. But I didn't have that. And, I, mm -hmm. and visually, I'd, I've always did it and it worked fine, you know. But uh, I, I just wasn't, you know, focused. I, I couldn't stay. There was people around. And so it's hard. I, I mean, I appreciate what, what the Bruce has to deal with sometimes that way, you know. And you like to share, you know, you like to show people too, you know. Uh, Can you guys think of uh, some sort of uh, person we should contact to do, uh, you know, do a presentation here on the telescope workshop? Uh, some AB manufacturers of telescopes or cameras uh, we should get in touch with and uh, ask if they have an engineer that would show us their stuff, or do a PowerPoint probably. Jerry's like, I'll give it a thought. I come from uh, Orion once. Um, but of course, you know, he's going to push their products. Yeah. We used to have, when we had SBIG here in town, we'd get them to come over. Mm -hmm. And Mike Barber, I think is still around. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I don't, I haven't, where did I have seen him, but a couple of years ago, let me share something with you from a CalSTAR. <laughs> John West. Yeah. <laughs> I only see him at CalSTAR. Yeah, he's. Uh, we used to see him at Kellogg because his wife was a teacher there. Uh huh. But I think there's. She's retired now, and I think they're spending most of their time in Maine. Oh. There's Joe Doyle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With yeah. the white whale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't have to worry about sleeping over wherever he goes. Yeah. That's true. But he used to sleep, he used to just put up a cot and a sleeping bag and he'd sleep that way. Uh, Out, outdoors. He, yeah, outdoors. He just, you know, he'd have to chase the raccoons away sometimes, but. Uh. Jerry, in, in the background of that previous picture, there was a big scope that looked like bigger than 18 inches. This one? Go back uh, one more or two. Well, there's one over there on the very right. Go back. There, in the back. Oh, the black, black. 
That looks oh, big. And the black. Yeah. No, I think that looks like about an 18 or 20, I think. Well, well when you like have there's two of them. This there's is two of them there. Is, one has got a cover on it. Yeah, that one there. Yeah. This is Gary's uh, 10 inch that he and I ground. Uh, actually, he ground it and I gave him direction on it. What is that about an F6? Um, no, it's an F5. Okay. It's, um, it's long. It's got a li little extra tube on it because he operates it from his backyard. And oh. um, like on my 12 and a half inch, I've got an extra, what, 14 inches of tube on the end that I don't really need, but it blocks um, the neighborhood light when I'm trying to take pictures. I, I know for the SCTs, for the dew shield, they say do one and a half times your aperture for the yeah. length. Yeah. At least. This is a guy up at uh, the Central Coast, Kent Wallace, and he's published a number of books on um, planetary nebula, very obscure planetary nebulas. He's done it. He even shipped his telescope to Australia, then caught up with it and went through their skies too. What's his name again, Jerry? Uh, Kent Wallace, K-E-N-T-W-A-L-L-A-C-E. -L -L -E. And this is Gary. Peterson from the Pomo, and of course, Joe Doyle. Mm. There's uh, Paul. Win. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. I think this was uh, 2014. Doing his endless tinkering. Yeah. Oh, he, he's think... amazing. What's that? He did get some good pictures. Oh, yeah. he always does. Yeah, he took a yeah. pic. There was one telescope that he had, and the mount was not uh, freely rotating. He disassembled the mount all the way down to the basic bearings, and one cylinder was slightly out of round. So he sanded it down till he got it back to round again. He put oh, it back really? together. And went on observing. <laughs> it <was> amazing. <laughs> he did this all out in the field. Yeah, out in the field. I don't wow. remember who this guy is. <laughs> So Jerry, Jerry, why does it say CalStar in Yellowstone? Oh, that's just the folder I have it in. Okay. I probably have pictures from Yellowstone in there too. Here's a guy's home-built um, Dobsonian. Well, that one looks like Tom's Dob. Tom? The one that folds up. Tom oh, Tom's. yeah. Yeah, this one, it does fold up, yeah. Oh, this is back to the beginning again. This is Gary unloading his truck. Yep. Where was this? Where was Calstar that year? Um, it was at Lake San Antonio. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me go back to that. I have it up near there. Show you. Who's the guy with multiple sclerosis that makes the breakdown scopes? Yeah, that is Albert High. Albert High. Yeah, he's he's got like a what a twenty eight inch scope that fits into a little. Yeah, like a mini Cooper. <laughs> there. This is Lake San Antonio that year. <laughs> and, yeah, this is the uh, nice. this is the boat launching ramp right there, that asphalt path. So well it's Lake Achuma looked like that also. Yeah, well there's there's nothing in it. I mean not it's the, it's not even mud down there. But uh, this was before yeah. the drought. This was because they had found something wrong with the dam or something associated with the dam and they had to drain the dam to fix it. Yeah. And then the drought hit and they never really refilled it to my knowledge. So. Mm. That's me waiting for the nighttime. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <boy. laughs> Well, Bob, you had asked me the other night about the weather, and I answered it. Uh, yesterday, it was overcast most of the day, and it rained in the middle of the afternoon. Last night, I could see Jupiter through a break in the clouds. I couldn't see the moon. It was covered. And actually, tonight looks pretty good. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, I get this layer of buttermilk clouds up there that really, uh, you can see hey, things, in. but pardon? I'm sorry. I'm talking to my wife, to Jackie, oh. to come in. That's why I'm, I just took the video off for a bit here. Oh. But I, I can, you know, I, I look out and come in. If I can't see Polaris, 
it's not worth trying to set up because that means they're yeah. not going to see anything else. Right. I can see the brightest things up there, maybe half a dozen or a dozen of them. Yeah, tonight it looks not too bad. Yeah, it looks fairly good yeah. out back. Pretty good. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll set up the eight inch because it's already upstairs here. Uh huh. I know yeah. it. It looked like it was going to clear by ten for me, and my asteroid last night was at ten oh five. <laughs> and I had to start setting up by about eight, you know, to get everything set up and aligned and ready to roll. And it just didn't, it didn't, even at 10, it wasn't clear enough. It was clear between 10, 10 and 10, 15. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I had a magnitude 14 star, which meant I needed perfect sky and it just wasn't there. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Here's a, here's a picture you'll like. Let's see if I can. There's Albert High, yeah. 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 He's using Joe Doyle's scope to test vibration, um, uh, you know, flexure and how stable it is. So he has a little equivalent of a seismometer down there, or a vibration <laughs> sensor. I forget the right word for it. And he gives it a good hard wrap. What's that? It's called a geophone. OK. <clears throat> It's basically a loudspeaker with a very heavy weight in it and a spring, so it measures the motion with respect, inertially with respect to its weight. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got a video of it here, huh? Yeah, yeah, a little short video. He said I could take it. Yeah. And I said, you know, this really, your, your tap has to be calibrated. And he said he has a calibrated tap. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. It's about half over, so you won't have to endure it. Oh, it's interesting. Uh, it's <laughs> He's moving around a lot. What's he doing? He's hitting different parts of the scope. Yeah, he wants to. Oh. Vibration. It's, it's oh, I'm trying to find out where the loose parts are, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He, he's written a number of books based on the results he's or he's got he's got this these measurements in one of his books i think the most recent one so interesting <laughs> this guy made a pair of binoculars oh out of c8s um, those look like about. Oh, no, those are much bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah. about twelve or fourteen inches, twelve inch, I think. Not a JMI. There's Ron Nixon too. Who's that? The red shirt? No, no, behind him. Yeah, that right guy? there. Oh, that guy, Ron Nixon. That's man. that's Tim Crawford's oh, brother-in-law. Oh. Okay. Uh. That's my scope. I, I, I have a lot of tape to control all the cables. <laughs> Looks very I use, impressive, uh, Jerry. I What's use that? Velcro one wrap. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Velcro one wrap is wonderful. You can tie up all kinds of cables. Uh, I wanted to say before we're done that um, I can uh, would like to put together a series on star clusters, uh, stuff that I've taken over the years, globulars and opens. And uh, I've been really busy lately, but let me look at my schedule and uh, sometime down the line here, I'll let, I'll let you know, Tom. And, um, you know, I can, I can share the things I've taken over the years. I've got uh, a number of pretty good images that have come out of those things, so. We just go I to your website and it's all there, Bob. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It's all there. He needs a dark frame. I've got the perfect device right here. <laughs> <laughs> the cat. Is that a cat? <laughs> yeah. Is it black? Yep. Santa black. All right. Well, nothing else. We can break a little early and uh, go about our business and go on the internet and check out the astro <laughs> photography <Yeah>. sites. <laughs> okay. Go have dessert, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can have dessert, yeah. Yep, I got a little key lime pie waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs>
Ah. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you later. Yeah. Good night.